night. Trump dumps fuel on the fire. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it, and you don't have any doubt about it either. Ripped apart by deportation. And the world's most incomprehensible video game. Front of the other, but now he does get lassoed. Silence up as well. He's, He's got, got Aegis. He's got the BKB. Iranian President Hassan Rouhani said that if America keeps imposing new sanctions, Iran could quit the 2015 nuclear deal and restart its nuclear program in a matter of hours. Earlier this month, President Trump approved sanctions on Iran's missile program. Rouhani said Iran wants to stick with the deal, but he emphasized it wasn't the only option. As NAFTA to tawafuq musharakat ba mabara uqyanus aram ra zir pa guzashte ast. Eyalat muttahide na sharik khubi ast va na taraf muzakere qabil e'temad. Rescue workers in Sierra Leone are racing to find survivors a day after the country's deadliest mudslide in decades killed at least 300 people. The early morning mudslide on Monday devastated parts of region, a mountainous town on the outskirts of the capital city, Freetown. It buried dozens of homes along with the people sleeping inside them. Officials believe the death toll will rise as another 600 people are believed missing. I took two people, two corpses, two dead bodies, both Children, we are wearing uniform, they are preparing to go to school. A web hosting provider is refusing a Justice Department search warrant, demanding the IP addresses of 1.3 million visitors to a website that organized protests at President Trump's inauguration. The company, called DreamHost, says the warrant, quote, chills free association and the right of free speech afforded by the Constitution. The dispute's been going on for months. A court hearing is scheduled for Friday in Washington. At least five business leaders have quit President Trump's manufacturing council after his failure to condemn a white nationalist rally in Charlottesville that left one person dead and dozens injured. Richard Trumka, president of the AFL-CIO, accused the president of tolerating bigotry and domestic terrorism. He joined the heads of the Alliance for American Manufacturing, Under Armour, Intel, and Merck Pharmaceuticals. The president lashed out on Twitter, saying he could easily replace any leader who quit the council and calling them grandstanders. Firefighters are battling wildfires across Europe for the third day in a row. And in Greece, a state of emergency has been declared in the area northeast of Athens. One government official blamed that fire on arson. In Portugal, crews are trying to contain around 150 wildfires that have injured more than 50 people. President Trump started the day with a little bit of distance from one of the worst blunders of his short presidency. He ended the day by making things a whole lot worse. This afternoon, at an event that was supposed to be about infrastructure, he couldn't help himself. He basically canceled out the statement his aides wrote for him yesterday, where he actually condemned the KKK, neo-Nazis, and white supremacists, and made very clear what he, President Donald Trump, really thinks. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it, and you don't have any doubt about it either. Define alt-right to me. You define it. Go ahead. Well, I'm saying, no, Senator, define it for me. Come on, let's go. Define Senator it for me. Them as the same group okay, what about the old left that came right. charging him? Excuse me. What about the alt left that came charging at the, as you say, the alt right? And honestly, if the press were not fake and if it was honest, the press would have said what I said was very nice. Wait a minute, I'm not finished. I'm not finished, fake news. This week it's Robert E. Lee. I noticed that Stonewall Jackson's coming down. Was George Washington a slave owner? So will George Washington now lose his status? Are we going to take down, excuse me, are we going to take down, are we going to take down statues to George Washington? So you know what? It's fine. You're changing history. You're changing culture. There was a group on this side, you can call them the left, or you've just called them the left, that came violently attacking the other group. And you see them come with the, with the black outfits and with the helmets and with the baseball bats. You, got a, you had a lot of bad, you had a lot of bad people in the other group too. 
This isn't just another bad day for off-the-cuff presidential messaging. It's a full-blown moral crisis for the presidency, and it's going to have real consequences. On a political level, this is going to isolate Trump even more. The trickle of Republicans distancing themselves from him could now become a torrent. Priorities like an infrastructure plan are going to become damn near impossible. But more importantly, the comments today have real ramifications for American society. The disaster in Charlottesville happened in part because the worst of the racist fringe felt empowered by the election of Donald Trump. While the president has often winked at his white nationalist support, today he made that support all but explicit. And you had some very bad people in that group, but you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. You had people in that group, excuse me, excuse me, I saw the same pictures as you did. You had people in that group that were there to protest the taking down of, to them, a very, very important statue and the renaming of a park from Robert E. Lee to another name. Those comments are sure to lead to even deeper division. That's dangerous for a presidency because people often joke when a president does something they don't like that he's not their president. But today, Donald Trump has given people a real reason to think he isn't. Charlottesville is quiet today. The white supremacists and counter-protesters have mostly gone home, and UVA students won't be arriving for fall semester until later this week. Things are still eerie here, but you do get a sense of solidarity from people walking around the mall downtown, even if they're still in shock. What happened here has had an obvious impact across the country, and officials in other southern states have begun making urgent calls to remove Confederate memorials before they become flashpoints of violence and unrest. In Durham, authorities are considering criminal vandalism charges against activists who took matters into their own hands on Monday and took down a Confederate memorial outside a courthouse. But stripping the South of its Confederate shrines isn't going to be simple or easy. Drive 30 miles north of Robert E. Lee Elementary School in Petersburg, Virginia, and you'll cross over the Robert E. Lee Memorial Bridge and into downtown Richmond, where at the center of Lee's circle sits a bronze Robert E. Lee monument. It's one of three remaining statues dedicated solely to the Confederate general, including the one in Charlottesville that was at the center of this weekend's protests. Still, more than 100 historical markers carry his name. Confederate monuments are, unsurprisingly, concentrated in southern states, but the legacy of the Confederacy made its way as far west as the Robert E. Lee Elementary School in East Wenatchee, Washington, and the Robert E. Lee Campgrounds in Boise, Idaho. As of last year, there were about 1,500 Confederate symbols still in public spaces. But why do all these monuments commemorating the side that lost the Civil War exist in the first place? Professor Kirk Savage explains that Confederate monuments first started popping up in the 1890s, and they were never just tributes to fallen heroes. There was a really big systematic push to promote the history of the Confederacy and the so-called lost cause that was largely engineered by women's groups like the United Daughters of the Confederacy, which had a very overt and systematic plan to rewrite textbooks, to erect public monuments that would establish the true history of the war. Confederate symbols surged in the early 20th century. And in 1917, 52 years after the Civil War ended, the Charlottesville statue of Lee was commissioned. The statue reframes the narrative around the losing general by presenting him in a position of power atop his horse, Traveler, who is said to buck any black servant who tried to ride him. It's basically a metaphor of command. The, the person riding the animal is the commander of the horse and therefore, by extension, the commander of men. Blacks who are almost never represented in the 19th century in sculpture are put in a very different position, typically a subordinate position. It sort of reinscribes forever the relation of white domination. And now, generations later, people have come to see these statues as symbols of Southern power and dominance. With the removal, they feel their history is under threat. I understand how the removal of a statue now can be framed as they're stealing our history. And I think it's a smart move on their part, but it's, it's a very false framing. And that's why the decision to keep or remove these statues has become so controversial. It's very hard because it requires taking a long, hard look at our national history. 
and trying to come to grips with the truth of that, you start to pry apart a national mythology. And part of the problem is that, you know, our national mythology has been built on this oppression of African Americans. So it opens up a Pandora's box, I think, particularly for the whites who have benefited from this history of oppression for so long. It's a very, very fundamental problem, and, and that's what you see just like erupting in Charlottesville. Three or four times a week, Yamir Pio Quinto Cruz walks to a cyber cafe down the street from his apartment. He types a phrase into YouTube and watches images of his five children move across the screen. Yamid lost custody of his children three years ago, after he was deported. There are now 57 home movies of the kids on YouTube, posted by their adoptive family. Yamid has watched every minute of them over and over. We decided not to show the kids' faces. The American child welfare system is designed to always give priority to the biological parent, even if they've committed a felony or are sentenced to decades in prison. And according to international law, families should only be separated as a last resort. But when a parent is deported from the U.S., their rights aren't always protected. This is how one such parent came to be separated from his children. Yamid was 16 when he left Acapulco and crossed the border through the desert on foot without papers. He settled in a trailer park in Jonesboro, Georgia, and met the mother of his children three years later at a gas station off of Interstate 75. Yo no, no entendía mucho inglés. Y pues ella, según hablaba un poco español, mucho, pero intentaba hablar. Y así como nos fuimos entendiendo poco a poco. Over the next eight years, Yamid and his girlfriend, living on his wages as an electrician, had four children together, plus one from another father that Yamid raised as his own. They never married. They argued often. Both he and his ex, who asked not to be named in this story, told us the same thing. Even though their fights were heated, he never hit her. Nevertheless, Yamid was arrested for domestic violence three times. The third time the neighbors called the cops proved to be the last. On the advice of his court-appointed lawyer, Yamid pled guilty, not realizing this would lead to his deportation. ¿Por qué le dijiste que si, si no eras culpable, por qué decidiste? Pues quería salir ya a la siguiente corte. Two days before Christmas 2011, Immigration and Customs Enforcement put Yamid on a one-way flight to Mexico. Eight months later, Georgia's Department of Family and Children's Services, known as DFAX, visited Yamid's children and found them unattended. The five kids, the oldest of whom was eight years old, were put in foster care. Records show that their mother never visited them and later tested positive for meth and marijuana. Yamir was desperate to return to the U.S. and reunite with his children. He ended up making six separate attempts to cross the border and serving three federal prison sentences, adding up to two years for illegal reentry. On one occasion, he requested to serve his time in Atlanta so he'd be closer to the kids and could try to see them. From prison, he repeatedly contacted DFAX, the juvenile court, and the Mexican consulate with no luck. Documents show that Yamid pleaded with immigration officials to bring his children with him to Mexico, but ICE did not act on his request. Pues el consulado no pudo ayudarme no en en yo poder agarrar visita ni los trabajadores sociales. No pude comunicarme, intenté varias veces. Todo el tiempo estuve ahí, pero nunca pude contactarme por vía telefónica. On September 9th, 2014, nearly 3 years after he was deported from the US, Yamid lost the kids for good. He was in Tijuana when he got the call. Yo lo hablé por teléfono con él y exactamente dijo que ilegalmente porque era indocumentado, o sea, digo es por pues sí, por eso, porque no tengo papeles. Pregunté cómo podía ser posible que me hayan quitado mis derechos solamente por eso. 
él no me dijo más, ¿no? que lo sentí. Él no haber podido ayudarme. La verdad que se me vino el mundo bajo también ese día que... No one tracks these kinds of cases, although one nonprofit estimated in 2011 that more than 5,000 kids were in foster care under similar circumstances. El plan de familias, posiblemente, posiblemente, okay. As Georgia's child advocate, Tom Rawlings oversees the state's child welfare system and is acutely aware of its flaws, including the way it often treats deported parents. Is a deportation treated by the system, intentionally or otherwise, as a form of abandonment? It should not be. Families should not have borders. You are still a parent regardless of where you are. And I think under our, under our state, national, and really international law, that is the way it is supposed to be. Our federal and state child welfare system are designed to reunite children with parents. Yamid has seen his children on family vacations to national parks. He's watched them celebrate their birthdays and go about their daily lives in their new home. He noticed that some of his kids had new names. Pues me alegro de que estén bien. Es que me da gusto que estén bien. Y quiero pensar que están bien, porque pues, claro que porque yo les mandé correo electrónico, me metí a fondo y agarré el correo de, de pero nunca no he tenido respuestas. Lo que más me duele es encontrarlos y que me reprochen algo, o sea, porque tanto tiempo sin saber de mí, o tanto tiempo ausente. Eso es lo que más me preocupa, me, me aterroriza. an online multiplayer game that's so popular its championship trophy comes with an 11 million dollar prize. It takes thousands of hours to learn Dota's rules, and most people give up long before they achieve basic understanding. Dexter Thomas went to Dota's championship tournament to see if anyone could explain the world's most annoyingly complex video game. A ticket to the Dota tournament costs over $100, and nearly 17,000 people paid that, and 5 million more watched the free broadcast online. There's teams of commentators at the arena that broadcast live analysis of the games in English, Chinese, and Russian. But if you aren't already a Dota fan, it doesn't really matter what language it's in. It's all going to sound pretty foreign. But now he does get lassoed, silenced up as well. He's, He's got, got Aegis. He's got the BKB. They'd love a clean He's got Thunder. Too. Thunder. This is Shannon Scotton, but his fans know him by his gamer tag, Suns Fan. He has a huge following on his gaming broadcasts, and he even co-founded his own professional Dota team. He's also passionate about getting newcomers into Dota. So if you need someone to explain the game to you, Shannon's your guy. This is basically my first experience with Dota, period. Right. I'm a little bit overwhelmed. To be expected. And it's, it's not like I don't play games, because I do. I play this a lot isn't of a game, games. bro. <laughs> this is life. All right. So start me on the basics. How do you explain Dota to somebody who has no idea what's going on? The way I would try to describe it is it's five versus five online play. Players will choose a hero, which there are 100 plus of. There are a ton of heroes to choose from. And each of them have their own skill set. So the objective, there's three lanes. To, it's already getting complicated. Yeah. <laughs> there's three lanes to a level, let's say. You start on one side, the other team starts on the other, and the idea is to push the other team to the other side and kill their base. It's obviously easier if you play a bit, but Dota is just one of those games that the base level is very high, which is why you know, the barrier to entry is one of the worst in all of esports for sure. So how many hours would you say you put in? I think clocked out right now, I'm at like 2,100. I'm approximately 1,070 right now. So y'all are experts. No, no, the, the, the hours haven't been kind to me. <laughs> Even the pros, they have stuff to learn, so it's, uh, and that's definitely one of the, you know, enticing qualities about the game is that there's always more to learn and you can always get better. Everyone warns me how, like, oh, this is such a steep learning curve, and I'm like, perfect. That's right, Lumi, a clash of titans here going the distance to start off day one. 
Winner of this match, already guaranteed one million dollars. This could be the real first blood. Chase the start, follow up from Kuro, Crush comes through and... So that, that was first blood. That was the first hero dying in the game. Okay, so somebody killed somebody. Right. And here they're gonna, they're gonna kill this, try to kill this guy here. control, the position is theirs, the game is theirs, the series is theirs, and top six is theirs. That's Dota. Watching Dota as a beginner is kind of like watching a really intricate game of tug of war, except with goblins and magic. Do you understand 5% maybe? <laughs> kind of. I mean, I understand now why people are hating each other. <laughs> Which, which is good. It's a step. It's very difficult to digest, and that's just Dota. That's just how it is. It turns a lot of people off, but like I said, once you hit a certain point, it's, it's very rewarding. Are you just really into getting other people into the culture? I think that, that just comes with any passion, I think, right? If you're passionate about something, it doesn't matter how nerdy it is, you, you want people to feel the same way you do. For me, it's just it's my literally my life. So, if I'm not passionate about it, what the fuck is the point, you know? You guys are just playing the jams. That was great. That reminds me of when I was younger. My mom used to put on disco Saturday night on the uh, radio to do the dishes. That's what I feel Every like. Every Saturday night. Disco, disco Saturday, Saturday night. night. So if you were going to ask when we would put that song on. Doing the dishes on a Saturday. I love those chord changes. They're like so satisfying. Too always when a song just does that kind of descending chromatic kind of chord change. And then in the, in the chorus, it kind of like goes major and I always love when songs do that. It's like a lift. Yeah. What mood would I be in? Sadness. I would put that on if I was really just... F I feel like it reminds me of when I listen, used to listen to Cat Power driving home from high school. Yeah. That's fine. all the notes. Love it. Hundred on my wrist, eighty on my wrist. What? Hundred on my wrist, eighty on my wrist, hundred on my wrist, eighty on my wrist. Deros, 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 deros. What is he saying? He's saying deros, Derek Rose. Oh, okay. oh, amazing. I think everybody should listen to that song. I would listen to that blasted in my car. Yeah. Probably in Essie's car, actually, because Essie listens to the music really loud in her car. It's true. Deros, deros, deros. That's Vice News Tonight for Tuesday, August 15th.